everybody, I'm Mike. Um, I, let me see how much time I have to make sure we wrap up on time. Okay. Uh, this talk is uh, strategic analysis for techies or how good is my business idea. And just to give you, um, just kind of explain my goal here. Uh, I don't think that I'm going to explain the idea of business strategy and all its detail in a 45 minute talk. What I really want to do is to let you know that it's a subject that exists. It's a subject that's, in my opinion, particularly interesting. And to give you kind of a little taste for the framework so that you can take a look at it and see, is this something that's going to help me? And is it something that's going to be useful? And it's the same thing the first time I saw a demonstration of functional programming. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. I don't know anything about it. But I know now that I want to learn about it. So that's my goal here. And it, this, the idea for this talk, and in fact, a lot of my learning about strategy came from long, long ago, back in the late 90s. I worked for a startup called Submit Order. Uh, it was a company that did online fulfillment services. The idea was that they'd take, talk to someone like American Eagle, and they would take all of American Eagle's products, they would handle the orders, they would ship, pack, pick, and do everything to get the product to the end consumers. And they were a big startup in the Columbus, Ohio area that took about $350 million worth of venture money, and they managed to blow through it in about three years. Um, and because you haven't heard of them, would be my guess, they clearly didn't do what they were trying to do. So I worked there as a programmer. I learned a lot of lessons. Primarily, I should have taken a lot more of that $350 million home. Um, but beyond that, I'd come home at the end of every day and just say, wow, these people are idiots. They have no idea what they're doing. And my wife would shake her head and say, no, you're probably the idiot. You have no idea what you're doing. They're well trained. They've learned a lot about this. Um, so after a couple of years of this, the company went out of business. I was looking for the next thing to do. And she said, you know, you keep talking about how smart you are about business and telling, all, telling me why these people are wrong. Why don't you put your money where your mouth is and go back to school and learn a little bit about it? So I did. And um, I, what I ended up learning uh, is kind of been like functional programming for me. I do Ruby development, so it's not a huge boon to like my day-to-day -day life. But I learned about a lot of really interesting things that have helped me in the rest of my career. Um, so there is going to be some business content. There is no code in here. Uh, there, however, are no fancy PowerPoint slides with building things, because I could never do that. And there will also be no synergi synergizing or paradigm shifting. It's going to be relatively fundamental stuff. Uh, so strategy is kind of an interesting part of business. Like, you know, you talk about it in terms of games, you talk about it in terms of sports. In business, it's often taught as part of economics. So when you look at uh, a business or an environment, you're looking at it from a competitive standpoint to say, how are we positioned? Is this a good place to be? Is this somewhere we want to build a business? And if not, what can we do to make it better? Um, it's kind of an economic discipline. And it, it provides a framework. So in my Ruby world, it's like an active record. It's not going to tell you how to create your business, how to run your business, how to build a product. What it's going to do is to allow you to take what you already have and what you already know and evaluate it within a context to say, is this a good place to be? What can I do to change where I'm at to make my place better, to put me in the best position I can to be successful? Or to help you understand, is this a place I want to make a $350 million investment? Um, and the, the goal here is not to figure out right now, is this a good place to be? The goal is to figure out, over time, is it a place that I continue to want to be? And do I have some sort of an advantage that will be there in the long haul that will allow me to continue to be successful? Um, I use the phrase competitive advantage. And competitive advantage is something that you can do better than anybody else. And it, you know, it can be short term or it can be sustainable. Um, and the goal is for everybody is to have a sustainable competitive advantage. That's something that over the long haul you can do better than anyone else that allows you to stay out of perfect competition. So to walk through kind of a quick example of, of, of how the business world would work in here and to show where there's some advantage and whether or not it's sustainable, let's say that you're the first person who sees a mouse and you say, a uh, computer mouse, you say, you know what, my desk isn't, is way too slippery for this. I need some sort of a pad that I can put down and that, with a picture of a cat on it so that somebody can use their mouse better. And you come up with a brilliant idea for a mouse pad. And you build, you know, you figure out what machinery you need, you build the first mouse pad and you start selling it. And nobody else out there has sold a mouse pad. But people are starting to buy mice and they realize, I really need one of these. So you're charging 30 or 40 bucks a mouse pad for something with a picture of a cat on it and you're making good money. So at this point, you've got a competitive advantage. You are doing something that nobody else out there can do. And you're making a ton of money at it because you have no competition. At that point, you are basically a monopoly. And if you're looking to make a lot of money, that's where you want to be. So is this going to be a short term or is this going to be a sustainable competitive advantage? Short term. 
because as soon as somebody sees you are making $30 a mouse pad, they're going to say, you know what, I've got some neoprene from my old wetsuit. I can cut that up, glue a picture of a cat on it, and now suddenly I can make a mouse pad too. And very quickly you'll see, anytime you see a business where people are making a lot of money very quickly, and there's nothing that keeps them from entering that business, they're going to. This is basic supply and demand. So you're going to see a lot of people enter the market. You'll see prices come down. And what used to be an advantage for you probably isn't. So if you were this early stage in the mouse pad business and you were trying to decide, do I want to buy this you know, $10 million mouse pad making machine? The answer is no, you probably don't. And we'll see why as we go through it. What we want to do is to figure out if you're in this business, how can you keep some sort of advantage to make it so that you can continue to make this profit longer term or to know that it's not going to last long term so you don't make a large investment in a business that's going to be going away. So it helps us, uh, the, the idea here is that strategy is going to help us figure out what our competitive advantage is or to know that we don't have one and to understand that as well. Um, so that's, I got, got ahead of myself, but that's, that's the, kind of the basic market theory, the basic supply and demand is that if there's a demand for a good or service, somebody provides it and you make a lot of money, there's going to be new entrants. The increase in supply is going to push the price down until you get some sort of an equilibrium. Um, so in a monopoly, we do set the price to maximize profit. In perfect competition, the, uh, it's a completely different formula. But it's, you make a lot less money doing it. So a lot of people thought these things through and they realized they needed kind of a way of talking about this idea of advantage and to figure out when it exists and when it doesn't. So there's a couple of really big models. Um, the one that's popular in the business media, in fact, if you go to any airport bookstore, you can probably find something from Michael Porter about the five forces model. Um, he's at Harvard, so you know he's smart. And uh, it's, it's actually a really neat model. It's the one we're going to walk through here uh, that will talk about ways of analyzing an environment to look at the competitive nature of it. The other one that's kind of a nice precursor and dovetails nicely, I think, into the Five Forces model is from the real Ohio State, or the real OSU, um, where I did my MBA. Uh, it's called VRIO, which stands for Value, Rarity, Imitability, and Organization. And part of the reason I talk about it is I love being able to say inimitable. I think it is a really cool word. Yes? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'm not saying it's not good for anything. It's just not the real OSU. Um, and like I said earlier, I mean, these, these frameworks aren't going to give you any answers. There's, you're not going to look at one of these things and say, now I know how to build the next Twitter or something actually profitable. What you're going to be able to do, though, is to take a look at your idea and say, in this framework, does this make sense? And what are the things that I might be able to change to make it work better for me over the long term? So when we're looking at a, at, a, at a business idea and we're using the VRIO model, what we want to do is to look at something uh, across a few dimensions. The first thing is, is this thing that we're doing valuable? And this is kind of where the magic happens in a lot of ways, because understanding if something is valuable is really, really hard. Um, I, one of my employees was a very, very, very early Twitter user, and I thought it was the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Nobody's ever going to want to do that, so I didn't sign up for an account for a very long time. It turns out Twitter seems to be somewhat valuable. Maybe not from a monetary standpoint, but at least from an end user perspective, people see a lot of value there to, buy, to use it. Um, and so when you're looking at, kind of, at any kind of a business or a product, you have to decide, is this product valuable? If the answer is no, it doesn't really matter what you do at this point. You're already at a disadvantage, so we just kind of ignore the rest of the cases and move on. But if there is real value in this idea or business, then we want to look at deciding whether or not it's rare. And so if you've got an idea for something, but it turns out like mouse pads, pretty much everybody in the world can do it. It's not a particularly rare idea. And what that means is that, yeah, it might be something worth doing, but if we're talking about a lawn mowing business, there's probably nothing you can do that nobody else can do. So you can't expect to make a huge amount of money doing it. What that puts you from a competitive positioning standpoint is what's called parity. So everybody's basically on the same footing. We'll talk a little bit later using the five forces model at, at rarity and how that can uh, and how we'll look into it. Um, natural resources are another idea. You know, if you've got really great real estate, um, an example often used is a grocery store in London called Marks and Spencer that has been around forever, and so they have all of the really good real estate in the city, and so nobody else can come into London city center and say, you know, I'd like a million square feet of space because buying the space is so expensive, no other grocery store can enter there. So because they already have this space that they've owned for a very long time, 
they can provide a service there that nobody else can do. Uh, McDonald's is another example. They bought a lot of freeway space very early on major on-ramps and major crossroads, and it's now prohibitively expensive to buy that space. So McDonald's, just because they have something that, they own something that's rare, makes it hard for others to catch up to them in certain areas. Um, so if it's not rare, you know, you're never gonna be able to do anything. If it is rare, and you have it, then you've got at least a temporary advantage. So if you're the first person to make a mouse pad, you've got a temporary advantage. Until somebody else figures out how to do it, you've got this advantage. So the goal there is to know it's a temporary advantage and to capitalize on it while you can, and probably not over-invest. Um, the, the thing that may, really makes a difference for long-term support here is whether or not it's costly to imitate that. So just because you have something rare in the short term doesn't mean it's going to be rare in the long term if others can imitate what you've done to get there. In particular for software and knowledge-based things, you may have some sort of really cool technology that's rare, but it's likely that it's relatively imitable if there are other bright people that can come up with the same concept. So if, if it is costly to imitate, then now we've got this, this kind of thing that looks like it might be a really good idea as long as you can exploit the advantage. You know, I have an idea for a really neat new communication device. It's incredibly valuable, it's incredibly rare, it's almost impossible to imitate, but I don't have the skills to do it. Well, then it doesn't really matter. It's, it's an unexploited advantage. It's a cool idea, but I can't do anything about it. It's only when we put all of these things together where I've got something that's valuable and other people want it. I've got something that's rare and that not everybody can do it. I've got, it's difficult to imitate, so new people can't start to do it. And I can do it. That's when I've got something that long term is going to make me really successful. And that's kind of what we're trying to get to here. And so this VRIO model, is, this is the only slide and it's a really dense one, I apologize for it, but that's kind of what we're gonna get at with the five forces model. We're just going to look at different ways of deciding whether or not something is rare, whether or not something is costly to imitate, and whether or not you can exploit it. Organizational ability to something or other. Organizational competence. I think VRIE didn't sound as cool. So the other way of looking at this is um, what's called the five forces model, and this is the really, really popular one. And it looks at things across a few dimensions. Supplier power, substitutability, the threat of entrance, buyer power, and rivalry. And I'm gonna go through all of these in a little bit more detail, um, but these are the five forces that get talked about. And they're, they're, the nice thing about them is they're all relatively easy to understand, um, sometimes hard to, to figure out what, you know, how the balance is in each of these, but the concepts are basic. So the first one is supplier power. And this kind of clearly comes from a world where you're looking more at natural resources. Um, so if you are Apple computer, one of the things you're concerned about is how much power your suppliers have over you. For example, how much power does Samsung, who provides a lot of their chips and their panel, display panels, have over you? And you need to know who are your suppliers and how many of them are there. If you're a business like Apple and you're building a product that Samsung is the only person who can supply one of the raw materials to you, you're in big trouble. Because they control a lot of your ability to innovate, they control your ability to make a product, they control your ability to be <coughs> successful. So what you, that's probably that puts you in a bad competitive position in terms of supplier power. The alternative to that is if you're using something that's a, a stock standard chip, like if you're building something that uses a standard RAM chip or it's something that's been standardized, your suppliers don't have a lot of power over you because when, when you think about it, like you know, if, if I don't like one ARM, ARM vendor's chip, then I'll say go talk to another one who provides something that should be pretty much exactly the same. So I can very quickly switch between suppliers and therefore no one supplier can hold me hostage and say, if you don't pay more for this chip, I'm not gonna sell it to you because you say, okay, goodbye. I'll go talk to somebody else. And that's an interesting thing in the software world or in the standardization world where what standardization does is it removes power from your suppliers if you're buying standard parts. Um, so if you've got a lot of suppliers that could provide you power or could provide you a product that gives you more power over them if there's only one person supplying you, they have power over you, and you need to understand when you're building a business how that breaks down. Uh, an example you saw recently was Twitter clients, where one of the main suppliers for a Twitter client is Twitter's API tokens. And a lot of people didn't understand that they had this supplier that had a whole lot of power over them, and they thought they could make tons of money by selling Twitter clients. Well, it turns out their supplier that they didn't really think about as a supplier, Twitter, said, no, you can only have up to 200,000 or twice the number of users you already have, and then we're shutting you down, and now they just got screwed by their supplier, a supplier they didn't know they had. So 
We'll look at some examples, of, some other examples of these, but that's one of the first dimensions you want to look at is who are your suppliers and how much power they have over you. Um, when we look at standardization, there's some things that, that factor into it, like switching costs. If you've got slightly different chips, you might be able to switch quickly between them. You saw Apple do that by moving from the PowerPC or uh, chips to the Intel chips. Clearly, they're not direct substitutes. There was a lot of work involved. But the switching costs, I don't think, were as high as people thought they were, in particular IBM and whoever was providing their power chips. Um, and the information availability is an interesting one, and we'll talk about it more in a couple other places uh, as we go. It, it is, but it's not. I mean, so the software, the Twitter clients, their, their supplier was a software vendor. Um, you know, people that do Facebook games have Facebook is this really important, implicit supplier of eyeballs. So when, uh, when Facebook made changes to the way you could spread your application virally through the news feeds, a bunch of people lost a lot of money because they thought they would have this great source of eyeballs that they got shut down. Google rankings are another one. If you're a business that depends upon SEO, Google is your supplier of eyeballs, whether you admit it or not. So there are, even in the software world, there are suppliers. They could be a supplier of data. They could be a supplier of brain power, a supplier of something else. It's important, though, to really look at your business and to figure out who they are, because everybody has a supplier, whether you know it or not. Along these lines are substitutes, and these are not substitutes for what for your your inputs these are substitutes for whatever it is you're providing so uh, an example is one our, from our chip vendors you know if I'm selling an arm chip then pretty much everybody else who sells a similar arm chip is a substitute for me and you can look at how directly substitutable things are if you're providing a product that implements a standard then clearly you're much more substitutable but one of the famous examples of substitute products and how people look at them are Southwest Airlines has always viewed bus travel as a substitute for their services. In particular, when they were newer and they did a lot of short haul travel, they realized that they weren't competing against other airlines that were $1,000 tickets. At $100 a ticket, they're competing against someone taking the bus. So they have to make sure that what they're doing is as convenient as the bus, as clean as the bus, but they don't have to go overboard and provide meals because their, their substitute, what people would replace them with, doesn't do that. Um, so you want to understand how substitutable your product is and, uh, and what switching costs people would have moving out of it. So you know, there, Facebook, for example, has substitute products. You could go to Bebo, you could go to Friendster, or Orkut, or you know, Google+. But there are huge switching costs there to move from Facebook to one of the substitute products that people could use. And by understanding what those costs are, it helps them understand what their competitive positioning is. Um, because of the huge network effect involved, it's difficult to substitute out Facebook for something else. Because for Google Plus to be useful, all of your friends also have to join it. And you have to get all of your really fun games that you like to play ported over to Google Plus. And this is one that, that Microsoft was really good at exploiting back in the 90s in particular with their Embrace and Extend philosophy is that they would make themselves a substitute for other products. Um, they would implement standard interfaces for things and say, look, we're an open standard, you know? We do this HTML thing really, really well. Everybody should use HTML and they should port their stuff to HTML instead of writing it for Mac. And then once they did, they had these really cool ActiveX controls, and human resources departments loved them. And so for some reason, every HR department in a major corporation decided to use ActiveX for no good reason. And because they had a standard that got people in, and then they extended it to do something else, now you couldn't move back out. So they were enough of a substitute good to get you into their product, but not enough to be able to get you back out. And so that's why even when I worked at Chase in 2004, we still had to have a copy of IE6 on all of our desktops because you couldn't use any of the HR stuff because it depended upon an old version of ActiveX. Um, then we talked about network effects. So you've got who supplies you. You've got how easy it is for your, the people that buy your product to move from one place to another. The next force is this threat of entrance. And that's, that's kind of this new entrance idea where if I'm doing something that's really awesome and I'm making a ton of money, other people are probably going to want to do it. I mean, that's the basic supply and demand theory. And so you need to understand what are the startup hardware and knowledge costs. Like, you know, if I'm doing some sort of amazing cutting edge research or incredibly high tech stuff, then you've got this huge startup cost because you've got to understand all of the basics in it. Uh, however, if I'm building a Facebook game, it turns out it's pretty easy to copy as everybody who's built a game that then got copied by Zynga found out that there's nothing that's really all that different about what they're doing and a new entrant could come in and take a lot of their market. 
Sometimes this could be a regulatory burden. Um, if you wanted to, I'm from Philadelphia, and so in Philadelphia, my choice of cable is Comcast. And that's it, simply because the Comcast does a very nice job of threatening to move out of the city every time, their headquarters out of the city every time they, the government tries to approve a new cable provider. So no cable provider can go into the city of Philadelphia because there's a regulatory burden that they'd have to cross and they just don't have the ability to do it. Uh, so Comcast, at least in, in Philadelphia, doesn't feel particularly hard about the threat of entrance. Another one is economies of scale. Uh, with back to our mouse pad example, if you know if I'm making mouse pads by hand and I'm cutting out neoprene and I'm gluing on pictures of cats, you know I'm, it's going to be very capital intensive or very labor intensive. If somebody comes in and is making thousands and thousands of these things with a custom mouse printer machine, mouse pad making machine, then a new entrant isn't going to be able to do the old method because somebody else has gotten the, the process of making each mouse pad so cheap that it's going to be hard for somebody else to come in and do lower volumes. And you see that with automakers. It's prohibitively expensive to build a new car in a batch of 10 because there's this huge economy of scale where when you build 100,000, you save a lot of money because you're using the same parts again and again and again. And that's why when you see new automakers like Tesla, the place they come in is at the incredibly high end because they can afford to do these smaller batches. Lamborghini, Ferrari, you know, they're not making these cars in huge batches partially because it's very expensive to build up to that level and you have to cut a lot of costs to do it. Uh, cost structure advantage is one that's often used in the literature. It basically means if I'm venture funded, I've got a ton of money, I can do things that somebody who's bootstrapping can't do. And if you're bootstrapping a business, you need to be aware that if you've got venture competitors that have venture capital money, there's tons of stuff that they can just throw money at that you can't do because for you to be able to buy some sort of new hardware, new machine, new programmers, you're going to have to make enough money or earn enough money doing your business to be able to do it. And then the size of the market. So this is what I'm going to come back to and talk about in a little bit when I go through some examples, um, because I love the size of market thing, because it's helped me a lot. Uh, th so the, the, the flip side to supplier power is buyer power. And that is that everybody is, has a buyer, and this is the inverse of supplier power, that you are somebody's supplier. And you want to look at the same things. You know, is there only one buyer for your service? Like if you're serving, selling jets and you can only sell jets to the federal government, you should be aware of that and not make them mad. And what you end up with is called a monopsony, which is the opposite of monopoly. A monopoly is if there's only one provider for a good. A monopsony is if there's only one buyer for a good. Um, Google has this problem with Android where, in theory, where, you know, people that buy Android phones are the buyers. In reality, it may be the telcos that are the buyers of their phones. And they have this very small number of places that they can distribute their goods in the United States. So they need to be aware of the fact that their buyers have a lot of power over them. In particular, consulting companies, other people that may have, that there may be a smaller number of buyers than there are sellers run into this problem. People that supply to Walmart in particular have found that Walmart has a ton of power over them. And Walmart can say things like, you're gonna cut your cost by 10% and you're gonna say, you know, sell it to us for 15% cheaper. And you don't really have a choice because Walmart is 90% of your business. Uh, so it's, it's, that's the kind of thing to be aware of. And then backward integration, this is this interesting idea that uh, the person that you're selling a product to may just decide that your job is really important to them and they want your business and they are going to do what you do. And a bunch of chip makers found that with, with Apple when they said, you know, going forward, our ability to make really good low power chips for phones and for tablets is important to us. So we're going to take on more of the responsibility of doing that ourselves and we're no longer going to pay others to design our chips. We're going to bring chip design in house. And you may see them do more and more of that because they are kind of hamstrung by supply constraints in the market, they may take on more of the manufacturing as well. That's called backward integration. Uh, the last of these forces, um, and I know there's a lot of this kind of dense content here, is rivalry, but rivalry is really how cutthroat is this business? Uh, you know, when you're making mouse pads, maybe it's a really cutthroat business, maybe it's not. And there are things that, that tend to impact this. The growth opportunities, if you're in a business that's going to get it really big, really fast, everybody wants in on the ground floor to get a piece of it. If you're this kind of day-to-day -day business, like you're just selling something to mom and pop shops, there's probably not a lot of rivalry because there's not so much money to be made in the business. Um, Another place you see a lot of rivalries anywhere, you've got a lot of fixed costs. So if you've bought that $10 million mouse pad making machine, sudden, and somebody else does as well, suddenly you really want to compete for business because otherwise you still have to make payments on your mouse pad printing machine, whether you're selling a lot of mouse pads or not. So you're gonna cut, you're gonna be very aggressive trying to get market share simply to make the payments on that machine. Um, 
And it comes down to the same thing. If you've got a bunch of people with a lot of money involved in this, then you're more likely to have this cutthroat battle to do business. And understanding rivalry is a really interesting place to be because in, in some ways it's good to enter a business where there's a lot of people fighting over it because it keeps you keeps pushing you. But by the same token, it's nice to go into a business where nobody is particularly cutthroat about things and you can go in quickly and take over the market. Um, so to, to, to kind of make this more concrete, what I want to do is to walk through a couple of businesses really quickly and to take a look at how they stack up along these dimensions to get an idea of if I'm looking at a business, what, does, what, what do these things look like? How would I evaluate them? And is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I'm going to look at Submit Order, that company I work for, um, a software consulting company, which I own, so I happen to know a little bit about it. Uh, kind of looking at some open source type things, an open source support provider that owns the software that they're doing. So this would be an example of before MySQL was sold to Oracle, the MySQL Corporation providing support for something where they own the copyright on the product and they can provide a dual license. And then somebody who's providing support that's unaffiliated and doesn't own the product they're providing. And if we have time, I'd love to talk through an idea that somebody else has to kind of just do a quick cut at analysis of it. Um, so the first one is this company that the idea was that American Eagle or Kmart would send online orders to this company called Submit Order. Submit Order would have giant warehouses filled with their product and they would ship it out to the customers. And so the suppliers here were kind of hard to understand. The, the, a lot of their suppliers were things like shippers, so FedEx, UPS, um, that when they were small, FedEx had a lot of power over them. The idea was that they were going to get huge and FedEx would have to take them seriously and give them big rates. Uh, but, but they were mostly integrated. They did a whole lot of this stuff themselves. They owned the warehouses, they owned a lot of the computers, they did so much of this work, they had a huge swath of it that, where they didn't have a lot of suppliers. So really their suppliers didn't have a lot of power over them. So all in all, they were okay there. Um, substitute, though, was a really interesting problem for them. Uh, in particular, the, they, the idea was that they would hold the, the uh, goods for these stores and they would be able to ship them. And this was very early in internet commerce, so the volumes that were getting shipped weren't particularly big. And so if you think of somewhere like American Eagle or Kmart, Kmart and American Eagle already had a place close to the customer where they held a lot of products. And people that were often doing nothing during the day, they had stores. So what a lot of our, what Submit Order found was at least early on before these businesses got huge, instead of having a whole separate warehouse full of stuff, someone like American Eagle that was getting five online orders a day at any one store could just pick it off the shelf, box it up, and ship it right from the store, and they could do it in their downtime. So that was an interesting substitute. It was not particularly hard to do. And because this wasn't a very hard concept and there was nothing that was technologically challenging in doing it, they, uh, they were a bunch of other competitors that could do it and they could do it cheaper. Their gamble uh, and where they based this whole $350 million thing was, was they spend hundreds of million dollars on gigantic automated warehouses, which they filled less than 1%. So in th they had the, the giant Amazon warehouses before Amazon existed. Um, and so it was a really neat idea. And if the volume was there and if they were selling things other than canoes that wouldn't fit on their conveyor belts or they had uh, Clinique was one of their clients and every time you'd try to sh send one down an automated chute, the bottle of perfume would break, and then everything else that went through there smelled like perfume for the rest of the day. In theory, a neat idea. In practice, it didn't work out so well, simply because they didn't have that, that volume of scale that they thought they were going to have. And because there wasn't this huge number of online orders, their projections initially were for a number of uh, orders that they would, ha they would handle that was 10 times what they actually did, uh, and was in fact several times more than the entire volume of e-commerce that was done that year. Um, but because they didn't have this huge volume, there was no real deterrent for somebody else to come in. I mean, when it comes right down to it, it wasn't that hard for somebody else to do the same thing because we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of orders a day. We're talking about a couple hundred orders. And you and a couple friends could deal with that. So there was no real threat of entrance. And they found people could come in and they'd realize the size of things, then they could do the work cheaper. Uh, and the buyer power, because of... Uh, all of these people that could do the same thing, the buyers had a lot of power. There were a bunch of people that would ship goods for you, and there were only a few major online retailers at the time, so the buyers had a ton of power over what would happen. Uh, and then rivalry, because of the, the huge fixed costs, and because the, everyone thought this was going to be a growth thing, there was a lot, of, a lot of people chasing it. So it turns out that this was a really bad business to be in. Um, th their gamble was that by having these huge economies of scale, during a place and time where money was cheap that they would have some huge advantage. Well, it turns out if there's a dot-com bubble and there's tons of people throwing venture money around, 
that's not true because anybody can go out and raise $100 million for something that sounds really good and that can do it. So I wasn't wrong, I don't think. I think it was a really crappy business idea. And if they'd stayed small and hadn't taken all that money, they probably would have been successful today. Um, another example is a, is a consulting business. And it's nice because, I mean, when I look at my, I do Ruby and Rails consulting primarily, or iOS, I don't really have a lot of suppliers. I mean, I have employees, but they have a vested interest in what I do. I mean, yes, Ruby is kind of an input good, I would say, but it's open source. I use standard things, and honestly, if Matt shut down Ruby and everyone, it all disappeared, I could go on and do something else. I mean, I do still remember some Python and some Perl. So the nice thing is I have a lot of control over my input goods there, uh, in particular with things like the open source hosting and OpenStack and all of these other technologies, Chef. Really, all of the inputs that I use are now pretty commoditized. So there's no one that has a lot of power over me. Unfortunately, due to Turing completeness, there's not a lot that I can do that somebody else can't do. Um, so substitutability for my business is not particularly good. There's nothing that says you should use my consulting company because I am so much incredibly better than everybody else. And I don't think there's anything I could do that would make it that way. Um, and the threat of entrance, I mean, I started a consulting company. And the rule of thumb is anything I can do, you can do, and probably better. Um, so it's, it's not very good. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm ending up with a lot of sad faces here for my own business, which which is okay, I mean, I mean, buyer power, there are tons of people that want consulting services. There's this nice fact that if you're trying to decide who to hire as a consultant, you have no idea how to evaluate us, which is good and bad. It's good in particular if you're not very good at what you do. Um, I always tell the story that it took me three attempts to hire an attorney that was competent because I have no idea how to tell if an attorney's good or bad, and they all sound good because they know how to sound smart. Um, so that's kind of nice, but because there's so many substitutes, there's not a lot of power here. Um, but what makes it really great is that consulting isn't a very rivalrous market. There are, at the very top, like Accenture and those folks, there's kind of cutthroat. But for us small providers, there really isn't anything that's particularly huge. Uh, so they, people think of it like a lifestyle business. And so I can make decent money, and a lot of other people can make decent money, and we're all happy to do that. You know, if I talk to a, a, a con potential client and they're not a good fit for me, I'm going to refer it to my friends. So because it's not a cutthroat market, and because you have this economies of scale problem where it's really hard to get big as a consulting shop and to do it well, uh, that works against you to be big, it's a, kind of a nice business to be in. And that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking of business ideas, is just because you've got a lot of sad faces on this graph doesn't mean it's necessarily bad if you understand the place you are in the market and if you're OK occupying that space. So I can make a good living. I can do it and feel pretty good about myself and have free time, but I'm never going to become you know, fabulously wealthy uh, by doing this kind of thing. So you probably shouldn't invest $100 million in my consulting business, but if you wanted to do the same thing, you could make a good living doing it. And we only have a couple of minutes, so I think we're going to try to go through maybe just one more of these, and we'll talk about the difference between a support dual license business and not. But the real key here with, a, with somebody like MySQL before they got bought by Oracle is that they had supplier power. They control the, the copyright to MySQL. They hire most of the developers. So this input good is a product that they have under their control. And if you contrast that with somebody who's providing support for MySQL but doesn't know a lot of the committers, doesn't have access to the code, other than through the formal process, and can't sell it under a different license to another business, now you can see where this other provider suddenly is at a huge disadvantage. Because if somebody comes to them and says, I need this bug fixed, and I need it to be integrated, or I need to be able to support something that's embedded, and I can't have it licensed under the GPL, there's nothing you can do about it. So by not having power over the suppliers, these other people are dependent upon the critical factor for their success and they don't have control over it, and that's almost never a good place to be. Anywhere where you're completely dependent upon other people for what makes your business work is a very bad place to be. And it may be OK in the short run, but you will find out, like the people that depended upon Twitter to sell Twitter clients, you will probably come to regret it in the future. So uh, that's one of the, the biggest takeaway, is to understand who controls your supply and make sure that they don't have a ton of power over you, or to at least recognize it and know the risk you're taking so that you don't invest too much, only to find out that you're going to get disappointed later. Um, the others are probably pretty easy to figure out. That you know, Stack Interflow overflow is a good substitute. Um, if you own the input, then it's hard to enter. And, uh, you know, everything else is kind of OK. There's rivalry. It's not a huge rivalrous business. Again, people are nice here, and they do this pretty well. So in the couple of minutes we have left, does anyone have an idea for something that they'd want to talk about and kind of think through 
from this business standpoint or from any other questions about how you would use this to evaluate your idea, your business, or your framework to decide, does it make sense to spend money on? Does it make sense to do? Yeah, it's fantastic. I'd be quite happy if somebody took the idea and did it. <laughs> well, there you go. So can you tell us what it is? OK. Um, it's a sort of a, um, a new version of a group of, of Groupon, yeah. um, but it's for, for nonprofits. So uh, uh, places like I think Time Shoes, a, a, lot, a lot of different organizations will say, uh, buy it from us, and we'll give a certain percentage of uh, of, of the sale uh, to such and such other nonprofits, to some nonprofit you put. Right. Um, uh, but there's typically no accountability in that. Mm -hmm. There's no way to really know if Time Shoes is actually giving any of you know, what you just bought to them because it can back out all the expenses and so forth. Right. So, so the idea is um, to provide a way for businesses to do that and pro provide accountability for Right. Uh, so, so, so here's a scenario: you, you, uh, you're going to go to the eye doctor. Um, you know that's going to cost you 300 bucks. Um, I, I have a theory that uh, people one want to do good, and two, they're lazy. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if I can make it really, really easy for you um, in two clicks, my my hope is you'll you'll spend the extra minute and a half to go, go to the site or. Google have a mobile app, you can do it right there from there. But anyway, here's the idea. Uh, you, you go to this site, search for optometrists. Uh, we get have everybody set up. This is a big thing. But you can find an optometrist in your area. Uh, you know it's going to cost you 300 bucks by the time you get out the door. Uh, so you buy a uh, $300 uh, gift plan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so then what? And, and then you select a nonprofit that you want. Support, um, and say 10% of the 300 goes to actually gets passed on to the nonprofit. Um, right now, I'm thinking we probably need about 10% uh, to run to run our organization. Right. Um, and then we end up cutting it. Then we cut a check to the optometrist for mm -hmm. for the for the 80%. Um, and then you go to the optometrist, give them the your right. and give them the yeah, and the, so the interesting thing, and what, where I think competitive analysis can really help in ideas like this, because this is, I mean, it's, you're thinking of it as a nonprofit, but it's not necessarily just a nonprofit. I mean, Groupon early on had some of these same ideas when they were originally the point where it was a tipping point idea. Um, is to try to figure out, if nothing else, to get into this analysis, who's the supplier and who's the buyer? Because when it comes right down to it with that kind of idea, in many cases, your buyer is probably the business. And your supplier may well be the consumer. And it's important to figure out who is what in this picture, because what you really have is the person that's buying a service is the merchant, and what they're buying is advertising and eyeballs. And the way they're paying for it is with that 20% discount that they're giving out. So to look, when you start to look at this analysis to figure out who's got the strength in what position, the first and most important thing is to figure out who's your buyer, who's your supplier, and what can you do that nobody else can do. Um, Groupon was a great example. They did a very similar business model. And what they thought of that they could do was they would have this huge list of email addresses that they would send these daily deals to. And that would make it impossible for anybody else to imitate. And does anyone know how somebody overcame that? So Living Social's big first thing that they did was $10 for $5 on Amazon gift cards. And you know how they did that? they bought a pile of Amazon gift cards. That was not Amazon doing it to advertise. That was Living Social using this for marketing. And overnight, they had 20 million people sign up at a cost of $100 million. And so where Groupon thought they had this huge address book and that was their competitive advantage that nobody else could imitate, the people at Living Social said, nah, you know what? I can imitate that really, really quickly just by spending a few dollars. So understanding what makes you different and figuring out is it really different and is it something that somebody else can imitate is huge. And I worked with Groupon very early on when they were the point, and it was one of those fun things to talk about is, you know, you think this is your competitive strength. I don't think it is. And it turns out it hasn't been for them. Uh, so 
the, just knowing where, who's your supplier, who's your buyer, and what can you do that nobody else can do, and how imitable is your business can give you a really good feeling for is this an idea that, that might work long term, or to know this is an idea that's short term, let's make money while we can and know that it's not going to last forever. But any other questions? All right, thank you guys very much. I appreciate it.